Our reading this morning is John's Gospel. It's the 14th chapter and it's the first 10 verses. We've been going through a series of sermons on Sunday morning that are a little unusual. And certainly I'm finding them a challenge, but I'm hoping and trusting that you're blessed through them. We're looking at questions people pose uh, as challenges to Christian faith. And we've looked at whether or not we can trust the Bible. We've looked at whether or not Christianity is true and why do we believe that it is true. And we've looked last week at science and asked, does science disprove God? Well, today we're looking at the question, um, do all religions lead to God? Do all religions lead to God? And our reading is John 14 verses 1 to 10. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. We thank the Lord for those words and we'll turn to them in just a little while. We come now to consider this question that is often posed as a challenge to the Christian faith. And if you haven't heard it, I most certainly have heard it. And it's this, don't all religions lead to God? Now, it has to be said that this sounds so tolerant, so logical, but actually... It's neither. It's not tolerant to the faiths in question to have their uniqueness thought an unremarkable thing, nor is it any more logical than saying all the roads that leave Livingston go to Edinburgh, for they don't, and to think so will just get you lost. These points do, however, illustrate one very popular approach to the study of religion in our day, that reduces it to nothing more than a human phenomenon. The view that all religions lead to God, of course, poses problems for all faiths, as each hold not only different, but contradictory views. Christians believe in one God, in three persons. Muslims believe in one God and consider the Christian view heresy or blasphemy. Hindus believe in hundreds of gods, and Buddhists believe in none. As for salvation, Muslims believe that good works achieve it. Buddhists believe a path of religious practices will secure it. For Hindus, salvation is after a series of favorable incarnations. And of course, Christians believe we can't save ourselves at all. Now, the differences there are radical and quite extreme. And so the view that all religions are different paths to the same God poses a particular problem, and we have to admit it, for Christianity. For Christianity is a very exclusive faith. It refuses to be thought one among many paths. In fact, it affirms the opposite that it is the path that God has taken to find us. Now, can you see the radical difference? And this is a problem too for believers, because affirming our way is the only way 
can make us all sound, and probably me sound, very arrogant. To those who think religion is man's search for God, it sounds like we are claiming, and I am claiming, that we are the only ones smart enough and devoted enough to figure out what God is really like. Now, this is, of course, untrue. The exclusiveness of Christian faith lies solely in the words of Jesus Christ, who said, no one comes to the Father except through me. We find that in John 14. So believers mustn't think themselves arrogant. We mustn't, and I hope we're not arrogant, but rather faithful to him whose word is true. Now, to ask, don't all religions lead to God, there's therefore simply a casual disregard for the notion of ultimate truth. And to help us meet the challenge of the question, I'd like to make three points that I believe the Bible supports. The first is this. Notice that the religious instinct has always existed. Whatever ancient peoples there have been, however small a group or remote, the clues to their existence always include evidence of religious belief or their take on the divine. And this strongly suggests that while religions disagree on much, their universality is evidence of an instinct deep within us all. And this makes perfect sense in the light of Ecclesiastes 3, where we read that God has not only made everything, but has also set eternity in the human heart. We are so made that an instinct for the divine seems hardwired into us. And Paul goes further in Romans 1. He speaks of the natural world as evidence that God exists. And even those, he says, who reject this evidence still worship something. Everyone worships, just not the true God. And if the Bible teaches, as it does, that we are all made in the image and likeness of God, then that's hardly surprising that we find such universal evidence in our world. Uh, for the divine. And so the universality of human religious experience makes total sense if the God of Scripture and the God of Revelation exists and he has made us. But secondly, while we seem to be hardwired for God, we struggle unaided to find him. It's true we might infer God. We can use inference. We can infer God from certain facts that are true of our situation. The existence of the world might suggest an outside cause. Design in the world might suggest an intelligent cause. The fact of human life might suggest a personal cause. Our conscience might suggest his concern for right conduct. The fact that we are to some degree conscious of him may suggest that he wants our worship. But even if all this is true, we still don't know God. We don't know him. And so inference only takes us a very short way, if we think about it. Now, this again makes sense if the God of both the Old and the New Testament exists. In Isaiah 40, we read, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you not understood? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. And then in verse 15, surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. How capable is dust 
of knowing the true God. So even though Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has set eternity in the human heart, it also goes on to say, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Or as Paul in Romans 11 puts it, his ways are past finding out. The Bible is clear. We don't find God by trying to manipulate him with a few religious practices. And so this renders all human religion redundant. He cannot be found in this way. Now there is Another reason we cannot find God unaided. And it's not a question of scale, but of kind. God is indescribably holy. And we in our natural state are lovers of darkness, whose deeds are evil according to John's Gospel. Or we are hostile in mind, doing evil deeds according to Paul in Colossians one. We are, according to the Bible, and in our natural state, an affront to the divine, and living each moment under threat of judgment. We find again and again in Scripture that each time one finds oneself in the presence of God, I mean the near presence of God, the responses of deep fear and felt threat due to personal sin. This is telling. Isaiah had an experience of God, and what did he cry? Woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory, the Lord Almighty. And so if we insist in thinking that religion is our search for God, God help us if we find him. God help us if we find him. Truly he is so far above us and so different to us that the search could drive us mad. Don't go there. <laughs> Don't go there. You're mad enough, as I am. But thirdly, because all this is so, if anyone is to find God, it must be because he has found us. When we come to see this, we're on the threshold of truly understanding the relation between Christian faith and other faiths. However we understand the detail of Genesis 3, it is not Adam who calls out to God, but God who calls out to Adam. It is not Abraham who finds God, but God who meets with Abraham. It's not Moses who finds God, but God who addresses him from a burning bush. It's not Israel who chooses Yahweh, but as Deuteronomy 7 puts it, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, but because the Lord loved you. The Lord loved you. And so the message of Genesis is the sovereign election of Israel by God to be the people through whom he would address the world. Now, Israel fails to be a light to the Gentiles, but the Gospel of John opens up announcing that Jesus, the true light that gives light to everyone, has finally arrived. Hallelujah. To fulfill Israel's destiny as the true light of the world. Hallelujah. But all the time, have you noticed, it is God's initiative. God does the searching. 
As Luke 15 illustrates with first a coin and then a sheep and then a lost son. God does the searching. If you know him, he found you. It's why Jesus describes his calling as to seek and to save the lost. If you know the Lord, he has found you. It's even why to his disciples, Jesus can say, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. And so to come back to our original question, don't all religions lead to God? Absolutely not. Now, why is that? It's not simply because they are wrong or that they are mistaken. It's because they are without Christ. They are without Christ. And as Martin Lloyd-Jones put it in an interview with the BBC with Dane Joan Bakewell, Christ is unique. I can picture the doctor saying this. Christ is unique. You mustn't put him, put anyone near him. You mustn't mention him in the same category as Confucius or Muhammad or the Buddha or anyone else. And why? Because he's the only begotten son of God. <laughs> this is not my theory, said Lloyd-Jones. This is Christianity. This is what the apostles preached. Hallelujah. What a faith we possess. And what a saviour we possess. And he has made himself known to us. And often in the most difficult and pressing times, when our sin within us cried out for the need of a saviour who could effectively resolve that sin, and we discover that he did so on his cross. And in the light that all that I said, how amazing is the cross that the Lord should come and find us and then die for us, that we might know forgiveness and new life. Now, finally, and I want you to listen to my words. I've weighed these words up carefully, and they do need weighing up carefully and listening to carefully. Finally, are all those from other religions lost? Now here we need to be very careful. The ultra-conservative will say unambiguously, yes, they have not accepted Christ and they are lost. But some ask, what of those who have never heard of Christ? who are brought up in places the gospel has never reached. These over the centuries number in their many billions. Some refer to Paul's argument in Romans 2 about the requirements of the law written on every human heart. But then he goes on to say that the reason for the law is that every mouth may be silent and the whole world held accountable to God. Now, what are we then to say of those who in any setting come to realize their utter moral and spiritual bankruptcy and repent of their sins and cast themselves upon the mercy of God, not knowing how he will save them, but hoping that he can? Here is the question, have they any hope? And I am leaving that in the air because I want you to think about it and to ponder it. I'm not talking here of other religions. All religion is bankrupt. All human efforts by way of works and religious practices to win the approval and affirmation of God are a complete and utter waste of time. No amount of good works or devotion to religious practices will secure a place in heaven for anyone, be they ever so sincere. By the works of the law shall no human being be justified. But we must be careful not to presume that we know who the Lord has or has not individually extended grace to. 
When I and you get to heaven, remember. When I and you get to heaven, as John Newton said, the biggest surprise will not be that some we didn't expect are there. It will be that we are there. That will be the biggest surprise. That we are there. And how crushing to our self-righteousness is that. But one truth will always hold as I draw to an end. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. I'm not given to mantras, but if I was, this it would be it. Jesus, only Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so, have we heard the voice in the gospel of the one who has been searching for us? Have we admitted our sins to the Lord? Have we cast ourselves upon his mercy? Have we embraced the Savior Jesus Christ and asked for the forgiveness that he won for us on the cross? Have we received the Holy Spirit who God promises will indwell all who trust Christ, making them compassionate and loving in the way that he is? Do we delight in? And find our true identity in being children of the living God. Hallelujah. What a hope. What a hope. And it's down to this Saviour, this Lord. I hope and trust and pray he is yours. And I hope as a fellowship we increasingly reflect his presence among us and in the lives that we live to honour him by our obedience. Say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> and so, our gracious God, we do thank you for your gospel. It is the only hope of sinners. And our prayer is, Lord, that as this gospel finds movement and hearing throughout the earth, you will continue to call many to yourself, that you will fill this building with those, Lord, that you're calling to hear the gospel, to believe upon your Son, and to live in such a way that reflects him honorably and truly. Oh, may it all be to your glory. Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. Amen. But now, may the grace, mercy, and peace of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.